where does one begin? Let me just describe things to listeners. Um, I'm interviewing Karen Cooper, who is an institution herself, just like Film Forum. Uh, you, you just refresh my memory. I want to say you've, you're a founder of the Film Forum. I know you go back to the original location. Right. But We're, I'm not the founder. I'm but you're not the founder. The founder. You can't, no. he, they hired you. Not as, not tell me. a little grayer. The area okay. Is I'm sure you've gone over so, the story once so, or twice before, so but, but humor clear. me. A um, couple of years out of college, I was writing for a very undistinguished film magazine and writing about what was happening in exhibition and about Film Forum, which was a tiny loft space on the Upper West Side with 50 folding chairs and a 16 millimeter projector the size of a large toaster and um, thought Film Forum was doing a terrific job. Peter Feinstein w was one of two founders but in its second year of existence was the only one left. So this was now, uh, uh, let's see, the spring of 72 and um, we had dinner one day and Peter said, can't go on like this, can't make $100 a week forever, leaving town, getting married. Do you want to take over the business? And I asked what the business consisted of. I'd never run a business. I was all of 24. And he gave me a suitcase of those purple mimeographed you know, <laughs> copies of letters, which before there were Xerox machines. We're going back to the Jurassic period here. And I remember I, them. I read, yep. read his copies. Loved the film because, hated the film because. And I thought, gee, I was an English major. I can write those letters. This isn't so hard. And... Of course, the place grew over many decades incrementally, but it really was a, a tiny little operation. Yeah. Film Forum is located on West Houston, where it's been for some time. Is it, is it the third? Fourth. The fourth location? Yes. Okay. Fourth incarnation. Thank you for... Yes. Okay, very good. And it seems to be the permanent spot for the first... I would say so, yeah. yeah. And it's on year 40 what? Well, at my anniversary? Well, you do the math. Okay. So 72. 72. So that 40, I can do. 40 plus years. Yep. Okay. Okay, uh, this is your entire life. It's it's really remarkable when you put it in that context. Do, does that ever, you ever like think, oh, I could have done this or I should have done that or why didn't I try something different? Have Actually, you ever been really, really tempted no, I'm to just... Kind, I'm kind of a monomaniac. Been, so once I this fits you. started it, it fit. And it, um, you know, people think running a business is about running a business. It's actually about solving problems. And the most interesting problem is, of course, what do you put on the screen. Mm -hmm. So that's the most exciting part of the job. But there are a lot of other things that come into it that have to do with uh, technology and changes and personalities and, and how A fits into B and mm -hmm. writing. I mean, I was someone who fancied myself a writer and I do write the press releases and calendar copy and um you know so language is a big part yeah. of what i deal in right uh so okay so were you were obviously never that tempted because i'm sure there have been, must have been offers along no, the way no actually there's never I, no one has ever tried to hire me away i am so ensconced <laughs> You're no, just... no, and i i guess i'm really not famed as a team player oh. you know i'm really my own little you've, idaho yeah you've existed in your own yeah, mm, I'm isolated so, yeah <laughs> okay well you've done an outstanding job let's let's just thank you be honest here there's no doubt about it film forum has a pretty amazing reputation and um, a lot of pedigree at this well, point. Well, I think s certainly some of that uh, is due to the extraordinary work that Bruce Goldstein does as director mm -hmm. of repertory programming. And Bruce began that part of, of what it is we do back in the late 80s and has continued to do the most extraordinary work in bringing classic films to the screen and, and finding movies that are previously undiscovered, finding finding and encouraging studios to restore prints that previously only existed in uh, you know some broken down form. Uh, so I, I think it's really the symbiotic nature of the old films that Bruce finds and, and puts brings back to life and the new films that Mike Majori and I uh, select to show that gives the place a certain dynamic. That's exactly what Bruce said. Well, he was right. <laughs> uh, you and Mike are, are programming the, let's say, the contemporary cinema. Exactly. For the, for premieres. Premieres. All New York City theatrical premieres. Gotcha. Uh, and 
one screen, so one screen is dedicated to the repertory, and the other screen. I'm just this exactly. plain devil's and then advocate. The third one is for premieres. Is kind of catch as catch can. If something does particularly well, oh, you have that uh, one. We have the ability to move it Fluid, over and right. continue it running, or we make other deals outside of our calendar deals and and for films that we think have uh, greater outreach. I mean, I am not your Negro, mm -hmm. the film by Raoul Peck. Raoul Peck and his on, brother, uh, yeah. Yeah, on mm -hmm. uh, James Baldwin's writing has been running now for uh, about 10 weeks. Yeah, well, that was an uh, Oscar-worthy. Yes, should have won the Oscar. Should have, Absolutely. Uh, yeah. Uh, and that, that's a nice... Do you, okay, let me, let's me let take that as, a, as a, an example, because oh, you brought it up. Could you foresee... That success? Did you have a sense that this would probably uh, have a good run, or you know, I mean, I don't want you to have to say I don't know what I'm doing. So, no, but you can and you can't. Mm -hmm. we, uh, both Mike and I felt it was an extremely strong documentary <laughs> that did something entirely different when dealing with race relations by bringing back Baldwin's writing, which was so prescient and mm -hmm. so really to the point, and in ways that uh, I can't think of anyone who who comes close to him. It's true. There was a moment, if I recall, it's been a few months, where I think he just says exactly like how long it's going to take until there's a black president or something. Like, you know, he almost, I, he made a mention of it almost to the exact time, yeah. you know, when Obama. Yeah. The man's up. been dead almost 40 years. Yeah. So that's pretty amazing. It is. As well. Yeah. But, you know, to answer your question, mm -hmm. the real answer is nobody knows anything. Uh, yeah. I mean, we, we thought it would do well, but as well as it is doing, no. We did not expect that. And a lot has to do with timing, how a particular film appeals or doesn't appeal to the public and what kind of uh, press coverage it gets, what kind of attention Raoul Peck received as mm -hmm. the director. Right. Uh, right. There, so for as many examples of I Am Not Your Negro, there are as many that are... Sure, that flop. That flop. <laughs> yeah. That flop. That's Flops. a good way of putting it. And we don't need to necessarily mention it, but there, so, and film form it is a lot of a, um, art house. I mean, it's almost entirely right. Art house, uh, I guess is a way to describe it. There is some indie films, uh, like American Indies creep in from time to time, right? Oh, plenty of uh, American Indies. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's another thing you have to balance, I suppose, too, the because. Foreign and American work. Yeah. And also stuff that's in some, yeah, the, there's a different, couple of different demographics at play here, right? I mean, you know, when I remember when you like, I remember when computer chess was here a few years mm -hmm. back. Sure. And I believe, in fact, I had on uh, the, the filmmaker, Andrew, uh, at the office over on West Houston above the theater. Uh, but um, And it seems like, oh, this is like a Sundance hit. Yet, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem like the, the typical film form. But then I think about it and I, I figure that, well, you know, film form also has to probably think about the age, you know, group and, and demographics of their audience. I don't you know. You know, we try not to be too strategic. Okay. I mean, yeah. I think you can over overthink these things. Who's going to be interested in this film? And it's a good film, but is anyone going to come to it? In fact, if a film's a good film, mm -hmm. it should be able to find its audience. We played a documentary called The Creeping Garden, only documentary on slime mold ever made. Now, that sounds ridiculous, but in fact... It was beautifully done. It was beautifully photographed. It was a gorgeous scientific film that had the sensibility of a science fiction drama. And mm. it, um, it was like nothing else I'd ever seen. Did it have a big audience? Nah. But it certainly had an audience of, of people who read the Science Times or read Scientific American or, you know, majored in biology. And I, I am actually not none of those people. Okay, I read the Science Times. But mm -hmm. it, it was just a wonderful mm -hmm. combination of visuals and uh, scientific insights. Were you having great conversations afterward then? I mean, it seems like that film would, as most do, would lend itself to a good Q&A afterwards. Both filmmakers were here. Uh -huh. And I, I have to confess, I'm generally, it's generally Mike Majori and not I, mm -hmm. is, at is the, the person who... Moderating or present. Sort of face at the theater. Yeah, I understand. Uh, you, do you occasionally do it? I occasionally okay. I do it. Yes, okay. I do. Okay. I didn't know if it was. Sure. No, no. Uh, you did mention you're a very private person. <laughs> so yeah. One of the reasons why I was very excited, actually, to, to sit with you, so, and I appreciate it. 
well, I know that sounded like a film, The Creeping Garden. Is that what Creeping Garden, like, yes. I, I remember it. The synapses are tingling a little. I do recall that, but I didn't see it. I didn't see it. But uh, I just imagine that if the filmmakers are available, they should come to, it would make sense that they would try to come to as many screenings as, sure. as they, they can. Do. Yeah. They do, yeah. Yeah. Because I especially, mean, I mean, in the evenings. England specifically for the oh, opening. Oh, okay. And I don't think the film had ever played in a theater before. There's so much of their gardens, those British, you know, anyway. You know, there's a great Dutch garden movie I played just a few months ago called Portrait of a Garden. Oh. That follows two men who are horticulturalists who've taken care of a uh, garden that's about three, four hundred years old and um, it's just a wonderful year within the garden that you spend you mm-hmm. know, again gorgeous cinematography and an appreciation of uh, nature I, I, you know I don't want to help Bruce out but I smell a, uh, a retrospective of sorts like Green Thumb Festival or you sorts know, Bruce is really his own uh, yeah, his own man I don't yeah. see him Bruce Doing the Green Thumb Film Festival. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, it's a natural. <laughs> I think we're going to get a think about how many people love gardening. You know, you get all the British expats coming. Of course, they all love gardening, and then you can play being there. And um, so, uh, oh well, I noticed that you have a bunch of postcards and programs uh, fanned out over the table here. Do you do you want to tell me? Uh, Let's see some of these things that are coming up. Sure. There's Um, a new film called Reservoir Dogs. Reservoir Dogs is a repertory release, and I certainly recall it, but I'm I'm no expert. Have you not seen it? Oh, I've seen it from years ago when it was originally released. I'm on more solid ground talking about the premieres. We're opening Obit, which is a documentary filmed in the uh, New York Times obituary desk and features a number of writers who... uh, really bring to life all those dead folks. I mean, it's a surprisingly funny and compassionate and humane film for a subject that you would think would be terribly depressing. It's not at all. It's really quite quite wonderful. Well, and, most of those uh, obits actually focus on the life of, of the person. So sure. therefore, it's just a little bit of a, an homage or, or celebration of a life, usually. Exactly. And, and the, to hear some of these... Uh, anecdotes because i saw the film at tribeca last year in fact mm-hmm. i did have the filmmaker on the pot on my podcast vanessa uh, gould vanessa right and her producer caitlin uh burke i think it, uh and yeah and i was gonna you know across the street from susan norgit i might i was thinking maybe i'll stop by and say you know you get me some of the obit writers on i'll do another piece sure. on it you know let's do another piece on the right. on the film it's worthy of it you know i saw it it was at tribeca last year so mm-hmm. yeah yeah it's a great documentary it's a beautiful very entertaining film. again my mind goes to uh, perhaps down the road a retrospective have i'm i'm going to be doing a screening with bob mankoff and uh, some of the uh, oh, the cartoonist, cartoonist editors yeah. at at dctv I'm part i have a uh, I, I have my own little film series called docularius which are funny docs about funny subjects or yeah. comic subjects because we all need laughter in our sure. lives at this stage, especially at so. Any stage, at any but stage, but right. in particular now, even though it's on HBO, mm-hmm. but Bob Mankoff doesn't come to your home and talk to you after sure. you've seen it on HBO. And it's another very, very, uh, just really fun documentary. And, you know, and it kind of play nice with Obit, actually, even though they're very different. And they're different, peer, you know, right. journals, of course. But of course. Anyway, uh, sorry I interrupted you. No, no, not at all. Following Obit in uh, the middle of May, or actually early May, May mm-hmm, 10, mm-hmm. we're opening Manifesto, which is based on the mm-hmm. uh, Armory show at the Park Avenue Armory, which was a multi-channel video installation with the actress mm-hmm. Kate Blanchett playing oh. 13 different roles. I did read something and about that. she's really extraordinary. She's chameleon-like. Yeah. I mean, unrecognizable. She plays a homeless person. She plays a very um, kind of slick TV announcer. She mm-hmm. plays a sexy punk rocker. I mean, there could be 13 more disparate personalities. Mm. Sounds like a one-woman over. show almost. Like, it you is know, a one. Like it, that's Anna exactly what Smith it is. Or something. Mm-hmm. It's a one-woman show, but the text that she is reciting in, in these various... Uh, vignettes it, it is each one is a different manifesto by um, whether it's I'm not sure if I ha- have the authors right but we're talking about major folks from uh, 
you know, the Communist Manifesto to uh, Dadaism mm -hmm. to uh, Klaus mm -hmm. Oldenburg talking about pop art, minimalism, and so forth, and both political and artistic cultural manifestos that are very intense and for the most part very serious, but mm -hmm. it's, the visuals are often very playful and over the top. So it's a great tension between the visuals and the text. Okay, very good. It, I, I don't suppose Kate Blanchett will be here, but... No, uh, we can hope. We can hope, but we're not sure about her The schedule. invitation's out. Yeah, okay. yeah. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you that Wendy Whalen will be at the th theater, and she is a uh, marvelous ballerina who spent several decades at the New York City Ballet oh. as, a, as a principal dancer and has since retired from New York City Ballet. Not Balanchine, but Peter Martin's Well, body, I think right? she was there during Balanch the very, really, very end, end of Balanchine's oh, wow. era. Um, she has since retired from the New York City Ballet, but has gone on to dance, modern dance at the Joyce. And this is a documentary called Restless Creature, Wendy Whalen, which deals with that period in her life when she was making a transition. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's fascinating because you don't think about, well, what happens to ballerinas when they're no longer in those tutus. Right. right. When they age out, which can be like a you know, short lifespan for right. a majority of them. That's true. You no. Know. Um, especially the Balanchine school, because it really beats up your feet and legs. And well, that's a part of the the whole subject is, is are the various uh, injuries and uh, operations, and mm -hmm. you know coming coming back from those terrible situations that she had after dancing for decades. Right, of course. Uh, I think I read the Suzanne Farrell or one of those ballerinas mm -hmm. books. I mean, she danced for you know George Balanchine and. Quite fascinating. It's like a guy that is obviously one of those brilliant, one of the most brilliant people ever, and yet tortured so many, so many yeah. young women. It's a give and take. Anyway, that what was that called again? You mentioned it's called Restless Creature. Or Restless Creature. Oh, there it is with Wendy, Wendy Whalen. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's uh, starting May twenty. May twenty fourth. Twenty fourth. And Great. Wendy Whalen nice. will be at the theater. Oh, terrific! I'm hoping opening night, maybe other nights as well. Uh, this is a perfect film for Richard. Okay, but it's, he, are they? They're not. He, they're not uh, distributing not, it, in right? In fact, the distributor of the film. Right. Although we have a lot of Hino Lorber films on the next calendar, but we work with a lot yeah. of distributors. Well, I'm sure. Obviously. Well, of course, but but I can understand why Kino would be a regular because mm -hmm. they're they're distributing a, a lot of these art art house films. It makes sense. Complete sense. That's a, that sounds like a great one. Any others that uh, I can see? Well, I, um, I, I'm asking, but I can see. Yeah, we have an unusual number of dramas. Uh -huh. coming up this summer, one of which is a uh, very Chevrolian set in, it's in Claude. The, the, yeah, set, set on the border of Switzerland and France. Okay. And it stars two of France's most esteemed actresses, Natalie Bai and Emmanuel DeVos. Mm -hmm. And it's a psychological thriller in which one woman believes the other woman is responsible for a hit and run accident mm -hmm. that killed her son. So they circle around each other in very uh, wow. kind of scary, creepy ways. Yeah. But two great actresses in a, you know, this gorgeous mountain setting and uh, mm -hmm. French Swiss border, and that's called Mocha. M O K A is oh. the title of the film. And it's a fr fr Dutch French film. Is that what you say? It is a French Swiss. French production. Swiss. Excuse me, yeah. French Swiss. Okay. And the filmmaker is Frederic Mermo. I, I love French cinema. You're gonna love it. Um, I'm gonna. <laughs> I, I take a word. Who is distributing that one? Just, just for my own. Film, yeah. film movement. Film movement. Yeah, another, another company another. with a lot of very good. Stuff True. Films. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, I uh, would have said that one too. So I, I assume you're you you go to Cannes. I no, assume actually, I don't. Do you Mike not go? Again, I go to oh, Berlin. Do you, you go to Berlin, we, which we is overlaps. The word, right. Twirl, yeah. You do. You, you divide and conquer, as it were. Well, we divide and hopefully make deals. But you, wouldn't you be able to sort of decide who goes to what? Because do he decide. doesn't have to go to no, those. No, he doesn't have well, to. How, do, how does going to Cannes help him put on a, a 75-year-old film about, you know? No, no, you're thinking of Bruce. Mike goes oh, to Cannes. Oh, Mike, you Mike said. I'm not listening very Mike well. Mike goes I'm to Cannes, and he goes to okay. Sundance and Toronto. Oh, I go you don't to, go to Toronto. Okay. I go to Berlin, and I go to the Amsterdam Documentary Film Festival sure. every November. And usually at least one other festival. Right. So there was a year when uh, Mike and I had grants to go to a number of festivals in South America and Asia. So I went to uh, Yamagata. And in, that's in obviously North, Japan. Japan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
and uh, I think um, Mike went to uh, Buenos Aires, and we've we've really kind of covered both the A list and the B and C list of festivals. Yeah. But the big ones really are Berlin, Cannes, yeah. Toronto, Sundance. Do you, is there a festival that you haven't been to that you really kind of would love to go to at some point? And, but you know, maybe it just doesn't make sense with you. There are parts of the world I'd love to go to that yeah. I haven't been to before. But maybe. festivals, as interesting as they can be, are not as critical as they once were. So many films that, that Mike and I look at, we see through streaming. I mean, we see them through sure. uh, professional sites, Vimeo sites. And yeah. It's not as necessary as it once was to and- travel. I understand. Uh, when you're looking at a film from a, from a programmer's perspective or or context, you're, you're looking at it at a different way. Like when I watch films, and you know, uh, granted, I don't program for a film forum yet. Or uh, I'm just kidding. Uh, I I would love to one day, but but it, you're looking at obviously how strong a film it is uh, from a just you know, from a dramatic standpoint, let's say if it is a drama, in fact, or, you know, you, you can watch it on a small screen at home or on your, here at the office and tell. Watching it in a movie theater is always a nice option, sure. but it isn't essential from the programmers. Exactly. If you're going as a movie lover and a film fan, that kind of thing, then, you know, it's optimal to obviously see it on a beautiful projected, in a beautiful projected I think manner, a, like, a strong film grabs you emotionally and it grabs you intellectually. It can, right? And, and you, but you still cheat yourself when you're seeing it maybe on a I think comedies are the ones where you get cheated because it's it's more fun comedies. to be with an audience that's laughing and that's that picks true. up on things that you may be slower at picking yeah. up on. Especially those Eastern European comedies are tougher to get the humor. Are you talking about like Romania, the Romanian, right. are, how dry and slow the, the pace exactly. and the, oh, okay. Dry, slow Romanians, I would agree with that. The, yes. You know, the life and death of Mr. Lazarescu, a wonderful I film. Loved it. But, and yeah. I did, I did get the humor of it sitting alone, but it's much funnier if you're with a hundred other people who immediately see how ridiculous it is. That right. Two doctors are talking over a, a man's, you know, body as he's suffering and talking about when they're going to take their next coffee break. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, that kind of, of humor is... is it lends itself to the exact, to uh, they have that infectiousness that you exactly. only get in a theater. I, yeah. yeah. I agree with that. That's true. Or going into the film form because you get some great popcorn, which you can't, you don't necessarily get at home. True. Or... The secret of our popcorn, you know, is that it's fresh. It's made every day and what isn't sold is thrown out. The The dirty secret of commercial theaters popcorn is they keep it at the end of the evening and they mix it in with the new stuff the next afternoon and you're really eating a bunch of old popcorn and new popcorn it's sort of i don't know 50 50 depends on where they started so you're eating stale corn this is an expose i had no idea i thought i knew everything about everything going on there we also don't sell popcorn with butter you know and i've had people complain where's the butter where's bring your own it's really a question I was told years ago by Dan Talbot, who runs uh, the Lincoln Lincoln Plaza, and before that had Cinema Studio and the New Yorker Theaters, wonderful theaters. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he said, whatever you do, don't let popcorn in. You'll never get rid of the smell. So that's been mm-hmm. our... That's butter, the butter, the that's, butter smell. Right. I, I never liked butter on it. gets rancid and yeah, no. Right. And it does, good. even when it's not, it does smell. You're going to get a smell. It, exactly. And, it, and eventually it just becomes permanent. <laughs> that's, that's what he said and he okay. was right. Yeah. So we've... Personally, I didn't expect that we'd be talking popcorn, but I'm perfectly happy to do it because <laughs> I, I've always preferred just uh, slightly salted. That's, that's yeah. plenty, yeah. you know. What do you, what do you think? I, I think I asked Bruce about this too. Uh, but what do you make now of the the theaters like Alamo Draft House? I'm just curious what someone no, specifically who, who's Alamo been Alamo Draft House. I haven't been there. You haven't ever been? No, I okay. haven't been. Um, but there are a lot of new theaters, and I think it's terrific. It's well, oh, that's it another cre- question. It creates a certain dynamic, and if people are getting more excited about going to movies instead of staying home and watching Netflix and streaming, I think that that's a good habit to get back into. There was a generation in the 60s and 70s in which the latest Godard movie or mm-hmm. Fellini film was the hottest thing everyone was talking about, rather than, you know, maybe Trump's press conference. I mean, it which really was... a daily was, event. Or, really, exactly. Or, it was breaking news. Or the latest, you know, series that on, on television, whatever, on television yeah. which, which has so replaced the discussion. A lot of these new theaters, um, I mean, we, we are not in any sense 
challenged by them, we think it it's only makes the landscape oh, right. more exciting. I agree with that. I think that's true. That's not that wasn't my question. I mean, I agree with that perspective that the more theaters out there, I think, helps everybody because yeah. it gets people again. You're right into getting out and and mm -hmm. and once you're appreciating that experience and if there's an emphasis in the theater of really trying to make the experience for the theater goer a positive one then you'll say oh this is nicer than just staying home sure. another you know friday right. night or whatever you well, know well i think there's and, a generation that's really gotten stuck at home and we have to get them out yeah well it's very expensive if you have kids, to go to the movies because not only are you paying for the movies, but you're also uh, either bringing them or you're paying, getting a sitter potentially. It's, exactly. a, it's an expense. However, so the idea of watching something on Netflix becomes all of a sudden far more appealing. However, for those who aren't raising small children, let's say, or who just still prioritize going out to the theater, I see that a lot of the theaters, there are there is a certainly a crop of new theaters or new newly revamped theaters with additional rooms or new rooms. Mm -hmm. And also, I, I mentioned the Alamo Draft House only because, yes, they have a big theater in Multiplex in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And I guess, you know, probably there's a wait and see how it does mm -hmm. before more come to New York. I think it's doing pretty well. I think so. But, you know, they have really good, again, good programmers and mm -hmm. they're doing things and it's very pro. But they do enforce this no phone rule. They enforce, enforce no talking. They'll enforce... throw you out. I mean, would Absolutely. you, would you well, throw people out? Our audience is self-enforcing. It is. I mean, I, know. I think our audience will throw you out if <laughs> yeah. you talk. And we don't have any commercials. I mean, yeah. I think it's kind of silly to make a big deal about all your rules and how serious you are about your movies. If your audience is serious about the movies, if the programmers are serious about the movies, about getting the best films on the screen and not just mm -hmm. taking whatever is coming down the pike from Hollywood, then you're going to have a more well-behaved group of people who are watching what's up there. Uh, yeah, film the people that go to film forum, and it's pro, it's it's the correct way to say you don't say the film forum. It's no, it's without, it's just film forum. Film forum. Yeah, out the article. <laughs> Got it. Those are predispo people predisposed for kind of like a serious ci cinema. I don't mean to say they don't have a great sense of humor. I'm just yeah. you know, or that they don't let their hair down and like to see fun, you know, fun, you know, uh, comedy, whatever action movie. But that they go and they are self very good at self policing in that regard. They're probably a little less likely to pull out a cinema, a, a, a cell phone, let's say, or start a conversation in the middle of the movie than they are at your average multiplex. Which is maybe playing the latest high, highly stimulation, you know, mm -hmm. high stimulation film like, you know, yeah. whatever superhero film or what have you. So, you know, that's my point. I guess this is uh, I'm going over obvious ground at this point. But uh, I was just kind of curious what you thought about ordering a uh, catfish sandwich and a beer. I think while that's you're... rough. I think that's rough. I mean, people make noise when they're eating. Their utensils make noise. The waiter makes noise. How do you pay for the damn thing? I, I think it really credit card, um, yeah. credit card, but even so, or it's cash, dark yeah. and you know. Yeah, they come by. I think it's a distraction. It's I think a little it's bit. tremendous mm. distraction. I mean, if you're reading a book, would you want somebody um, putting food in your face while you're you're doing that? And I think watching a movie should be an immersive experience if it's a good movie. Mm -hmm. If it's worth watching, it, it should be worth watching and not eating at the same time. Or at least if you're eating, to my mind, it should be something that's pretty easy to eat like a bag of popcorn so i'm not mm -hmm. i'm not enamored of this dining and and watching movies experience maybe in kansas city it's okay there's a new yorker in me speaking um yeah. just that there are so many good mm -hmm. restaurants in new york that to have to go to a particular movie house to both eat and see the movie i would rather go to the restaurant i want to go to and do that before i why cheat yourself go ahead do both that yeah. night you know by the way i think karen was referring to a kansas city kansas if you're listening not kansas city iowa just to okay. be because <laughs> we don't want to lose any of my iowa listeners you know it's a very big film uh state i'm going to make sure i got to everything before before you uh, other than the, that, two or three festivals though. Do you get to get? Do you go out to the movies at all? I mean, I, I know we've established you. Stru you have to watch. Your schedule is such that you're streaming or you're you know, at the film. I stay form. in for but movies. Go? I go at, almost yeah. every weekend. I spend several hours looking at at Vimeos. I but yes, the, the, the truth is, yes, I do go out to movies and I do see commercial work. My husband's a member of the Academy, so we get all those DVDs. Uh, what does he do? Uh, he is an animator. George oh, is he? Griffin. Yeah. Oh, George Griffin. Yeah. I say it like I, so, I'm familiar with it. Of him. course, 
I do, I do see commercial work, and I think that's important. I want to know what the landscape is like, and there are marvelous commercial films. I'm not mm-hmm. someone who thinks that it has to be an independent. To but be you don't, you don't do a lot value. of the party going and events. Just not going. my personality. Not I, I a party it. animal. No, no, I get it. Because you do have to put some, you have to put some of your attention into keeping aware or being aware of the landscape, as you just sure. said. And so, getting out and seeing these other movies that you're not likely to program is is sometimes important too. Absolutely. And, right, and an ear to the ground. So you must read a lot, I assume, and I just do. talk to other. Do you talk to other programmers a lot, other than no? no? Really? <laughs> no, you did say at the beginning you were fairly isolated. Not, not so I understand. Not particularly. And it works for you. It's yeah. clear. Whatever you're doing, continue to do. Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people can go to filmform.org, right? It is org, right? Yes. And they can uh, download the program. You you have always have the latest film uh, schedules up there. I I'm checking it all the time. And you can join the film. You can join Film Forum. You can. You can become a member. It's a very be, good deal. It is right. It Do is. you get discounts to the you screenings? Get, or seventy-five dollars a year, and mm-hmm. uh, students and seniors fifty dollars, so a third off. You get in for eight dollars instead of fourteen, so it's really the best deal in town. Right. So it makes complete sense, and it's. It's so easily, it's very accessible. The theater is located uh, just... West uh, Houston, just west, Houston, west just of 6th couple... Avenue. Very just... close to so... every subway that goes to West 4th Street. Right. And the one train. And the one. And, right. Uh, right by the one train as well. The Houston stuff. If you happen to live downtown, easy mm-hmm. walking distance, Soho, the village, NoHo. Oh, this is great. Thank you so much for, for doing this. Uh, Thank you. You know, Karen Cooper... You're the. What's your official title, by the way? So I just director. Sure. director of Film Forum. Correct. I think you would be great. You, you don't give yourself enough credit. I think you should be in the lobby more and meet all your. I could uh, change the title to Zarina. I'm sorry to think that <laughs> <laughs> might work. Maybe then you can affect the government for the next president too. Right. If you're. Thank you very much. It Thank was a real you. pleasure to talk with you. Thank yeah. you. Yeah.